The body piecing industry as a whole is heavily, heavily invested in looking after the client. That's their main priority. The person who sits in the bedroom or in the kitchen firing holes in people is after one thing and one thing only, and that's money. You've got two options, haven't you? People who are getting pierced, they want a professional. Act like one. Right, what we're going to be talking about now is sterilisation and cross-contamination. When it comes to cross-contamination, please refer to the Barber's Index for all the appropriate information on that. Yeah? It is a very serious subject and you do need to follow it up. It does also help for your studio immensely. The sterilisation mechanisms are as follows. Water purifier and a vacuum autoclave. Vacuum autoclave, very, very nice and easy to use. Put your products to be sterilised in something like this. You get them in various grades and sizes. Sterilisation pouch. Rip the top off, place it in the actual autoclave itself. The actual autoclave, dead easy. Put in, that's what I'm doing. I'm putting things in pouches. I want it sterilised. It'll sterilise to 134 degrees centigrade. Nice and easy. And it'll go through the cycle, drying included, in approximately 20 21 minutes. As you can see, nice and easy to kick off. Leave it as it stands. It'll print you out a receipt to tell you everything that's gone on. It will also tell you whether or not it's sterilised. That's it, nice and easy. What I'm going to be taking you through now is the studio and the basic setup of it. The basic says you need to push towards having a cool, calm environment. If you've got thrash colour music on, it's going to get you nowhere. The client's going to be coming in already hyped up. By the time you get them on the couch, they're just going to sit there and faint straight away before you've even touched them. Calm them down. Have a calm, cool environment, clinical as well, because that's the actual impression and that's the actual standard you need to be striving for. Just to give you a nice guideline around the studio, you're going to be looking at your bench, your bench rolls, you've got gloves both sides because at some stage you might actually be working on the other side of the bed. You've got all your jewellery you need at hand, all your forceps at hand, all your needles already pre-packed, your sharp spots and your station and basically anaesthetics if you actually choose to actually use these products. The actual station itself should actually carry every single product you want to carry that piercing out. And now we're going to talk about clients. Clients come in every single shape and sizes. Sometimes they come in the crap in themselves, sometimes they actually come in and they're not bothered with the process that's going on. If they are crap in themselves, calm them down, have a laugh with them, whatever it takes to take the mind off what they are actually having done. If they're confident, enjoy it, have yourself a good time with the piercing. In the same breath, so will they, whatever. Always give off a nice, positive, assertive attitude. The more assertive you are, the more willing people are to actually let you play with their flesh, put it quite bluntly. If the accidents do happen and they faint, you never know, they might actually pee themselves or chuck the bag up in the sink, whatever. Main priority, always get the name, the first name. Talk to them in that respect, tell them your name, calm them down, you're no longer a stranger. The embarrassment factor disappears slightly. On top of that, always make sure you send them out the studio happy and positive. There's no point sending someone out into the studio with vivid being with sick down the chin because everyone's going to be sitting there, it's their turn next. They're walking through your clients. So what kind of attitude are they going to be thinking and what kind of feelings are they having when they come in and they're looking at you? Right, genital piercings. I'm not actually going to teach you genital piercings at this moment in time. What I'm going to actually do is do this with you personally. There's no point letting you loose of flaps, dongs and all that kind of thing at this moment in time. There's a couple of things to remember though when you're sitting in, watching these things that are actually being performed. One of the main things first of all is respect. Just remember, it's a closed studio, as in the terms of make sure no one comes into the doors, because obviously you need to respect the client's confidentiality as well. And also think about the fact whether him or her is actually getting their personal super private possession out and showing it in front of complete strangers and strangely this will turn many people into shy shrinking violets. The main basics of this is always, upon always, show respect. Right, what we're also going to be teaching you today is a technique we've refined for actually stopping piercings bleeding. How it basically works is like this, when everyone usually does a piercing the piercing and the jewellery are exactly the same calibre and size 
or sometimes people will actually pierce a lot bigger than the jewelry that's necessary to be putting in. Obviously giving your body plenty enough time, time to let blood come steaming out of it. What we do is actually pierce it, the blade is actually smaller than the actual jewelry we stick in and the process of putting the jewelry in the cannula is what stretches it. It all sounds very complicated I know, but it breaks down like this. If you're going to actually do a 1.6mm bar piercing, you're actually going to use a 1.7mm needle. The actual blade in the needle is 1.5mm. When you actually put the jewelry in, slightly stretching the cannula to the size, it'll actually take it up to the size of 17 thus sealing the piercing by 0.2mm. It sounds very complicated, but it's a technique that works, we've refined and it is exceedingly good as a job. You will find that hardly anybody will bleed. Right, I'm going to show you this technique a bit more close up and a bit more refined. Taking a 1.7mm needle and a 1.6 piece of jewellery, when the piercing is actually carried out, you actually reintroduce the needle, slightly withhold it back onto itself, so that that's there acting as a, acting as a strengthener for the actual process piece of jewellery in the end. As you can see it's slightly, very smally enlarged the area. Withdraw the needle, discard it, run it through and you'll find that it will actually seal the piercing. What we're now going to do is do two eyebrow piercings and actually demonstrate this for you. As you can see here we've got two piercings, two eyebrows exactly the same piercings. I've got over here, I've an orange, over here I've got a grey. First thing we'll do is we'll stick the orange piercing in. As you can see, we're already in a situation where we need to control bleeding straight away. Okay, we'll just actually hold that. And just jumping in front of the camera. You just take the patch off for me. There you go. It doesn't take much to actually work out the difference in the actual style and the techniques and how it actually works and benefits the client as well as your studio. Right, there you go. The actual technique is exceedingly well proven just with that example that we did. There are a couple of actual differences in certain piercings where you can and can't use this. The only one we've ever found is navel piercings. There is a great reduction in actual bleeding in regards to this piercing anyhow. So personally I would recommend an orange. Your client will dance all over the bed and the concept of trying to do refined, stylized work with someone who's trying the best to actually get out the door while still getting pierced is probably not the best way to actually go forward. Also, the tongue piercing. It's not a problem with using this technique with tongue piercings. The only thing you do need to remember is because it actually it's that tight and it tightens the piercings up you do need to tell the client that if they actually abuse the piercing over the next couple of days excessive talking, drug abuse etc etc which you shouldn't be doing any output clients or clients then what will actually happen is the tongue will go black and blue no you haven't hit anything major it's just the fact that the muscle cannot go through its normal activities right what we have here is your client we're just going to run you through some of the basic piercings that are available on the market. There are some other ones, but this particular client carries a fair arraignment of them. You've got the eyebrows with rings, eyebrows with bars, both sides of a nose pierce. You've got your labrets at the bottom. You've also got some extreme leg piercing at the top. On the side here, you've got an industrial, inner conch, date at the back there, tragus, tunnels and various other rings. On the side here, you've got a lot of scaffolding work tragus, rings and tunnels again. Internally, we've got a random assortment of tongue piercings as well. Right, what we're going to start with here is your basic ear piercing. What you want to do with regards to marking for an ear piercing is always imagine the ear below itself as a circle. Try and make a placement in the middle I have had to do some minor adjustments in respect to this particular client who's got a bead fitted in the bottom of his ear. 
Piercing itself is very nice and easy. Coming towards it with the clamps, you want to make sure you apply the clamps evenly both sides. So you've got no actual distortion on the back of the ear. Holding the actual needle so it fits in the angle like a dart. Nice clean straight run through. Withdraw the needle, placing that on the side, withdrawing the actual clamps itself, making sure not to pull the cannula back out. Come back to the piercing with the needle itself and the jewelry in hand. Just get the appropriate hair out of the way. The jewelry in, discard the needle. And then making sure you apply pressure on the front so as not to actually pull the load or distort it. Push your jewelry all the way through nice and easy. There you go. Draw the cannula and then approach your jewelry with the ball to be fitted. There you go, nice and easy. What you want to do with regards to cleaning is the client needs to clean it for the next approximate six weeks with something like which is the wool salt water. Right. What we're going to be doing here is your basic belly button, well basically your navel piercing. On this particular client we're going to be doing it on a reverse because he's already got his belly button done as you can see with a ring. First thing you need to do as always is clean the area down. And then the next thing we want to do is get prepared up for marking. With regards to marking, you need to imagine there's an imaginary line that follows the whole length of the client. Just have a look, straight up the client's body just to make sure it is actually in line and then let's start preparing up for the piercing. Making sure your clamps are at the right actual tension, apply the clamps in place and have a check on both sides to make sure your run's quite good. Approach with the needle. Just place it on that side and check where your exit is and run it straight through nice and simple. Withdraw the needle. The needle can actually be discarded at this stage and withdraw the clamps. Cutting the back of the cannula off. Discard that as well. And then approach with the jewellery. Making sure you put pressure on the skinny so it doesn't actually pull itself out. Just run the jewellery up nice and simply. Keep your finger on there to hold the skin just as you pull the cannula off. And then let's get ready to actually just screw the ball on. Pull the skin into alignment, and there you go. Slight bone oil leaking out of there, but nothing too extreme that will clot very quickly. There you go, you've got a spot on reverse poly button piercing. Right, with regards to aftercare for this particular piercing, what the client needs to do is go and purchase something on the lines of like me pull. He needs to keep the piercing covered up for approximately a week, changing them once every single day for that period, and as of tomorrow. If he starts actually applying some witch hazel or salt water for I'd say approximately six weeks. Right, what we're going to be doing now is your basic nipple piercing. One of the most common mistakes with this actual piercing is to actually mark it too far back. What you find this does is prolongs healing and also causes too much skin trauma in the particular area. The marking should actually just be positioned just where the nipple actually raises itself up and starts to insinuate itself. At this particular time, obviously we're working on a male. If it's for a female, 
there's two points of view to take. One of the best recommendations is to ask the client whether it's actually for the beach or for the bedroom. If it is actually for the bedroom, what you need to do is to lie the actual person down. The reason being is, the actual breast is a tissue on its own and it obviously it moves around in its various positions that it lies in. If it's marked up when it's actually lying in the lying down position, it will be perfectly straight for that particular purpose. When they finally sit up, you're going to find that it's a very slight twisting on the actual breast itself when it finds its natural place of sitting, in which case you might get a slight amount of differentiation within the levelings of the bars. Obviously, this works vice versa as well. Right, I've already cleaned the particular nipple down with a sturette, and as you can tell, I've already marked it up nice and easily, so I've got two nice level marks either side, just as the actual nipple starts to insinuate, as I was talking about previously. Right, getting prepared to pierce. First thing, same again, always test the actual tension of your clamps themselves. You need a natural firm grip of the nipple, but in the same breath, you don't really want to be crushing it. Always have a check, you've got the marks where you actually want them to be. And then you need to start to prepare to think about piercing yourself. Coming towards it with the actual needle itself. Same again, place the needle on one side, check your level as you come out. There you go, nice easy clean run. Take the needle out and withdraw the clamps itself. Coming back to the needle with your needle itself. Draw the needle and discard. Slightly grasp the skin, keeping the pressure underneath, and run the jewelry through nice and easy. Take the cannula off. And all we need to do now is just place the ball in position. Now the piercing up. And there you go, you have your basic nipple piercing. With regards of aftercare, what I personally recommend, clean both sides with witch hazel or salt water, making sure that they actually clean any debris off both sides of the ring. This also works if, shall we say, the nip piercing is being used for entertainment value as well. You do not have to clean it spot on. Okay. Right, we're going to be doing an eyebrow piercing with a 1.6 by 10 mil bar. As is the norm, first thing, let's clean the area down. Now let's prepare to mark. Using the actual client's bottom of his eye, running it up. As you can tell, we put the marks down nice and easily. Come back to the piercing with the clamps, prepare everything up. Apply the clamps, checking both sides. And then just run the needle through nice and smoothly. Withdraw the needle, withdraw the clamps. Return with the needle and the jewellery. Be very, very careful. Withdraw the needle. And then keeping your pressure on the bottom, push the bar all the way through. Hold the top, and just spin the cannula off. Screw the ball on, push the bar up, and then push the bar down. Nice eyebrow piercing. I'll just get this particular client's tissue. But cleaning wise, you need to put some witch hazel, salt water, cleaning both sides of the bar, and slight bits of movement.
for approximately six weeks. What we're going to be doing now is your basic librette piercing. What we're going to be doing fitting in this is a 1.6 by 12 mil bar. The reasoning being is the standard bar is an 8 mil, but if you had to replace that first time, the internal tissue, with it being that bit softer, there is going to be some swelling in that, and you could actually find that you could embed the librette itself. If once you've done the piercing, the client comes back in a week's time and gets an 8 mil fitted, it's going to be ending up exactly what he wants. With regards to marking, what you need to do is visualise a mark, align it all the way through the face and mark appropriately. Let's get the client to very slightly open his mouth. As you can see the line follows all the way through. If it's slightly off, just make the corrections. Right, with respect of clamping the piercing, what you need to do is slightly pull the lip out on itself and actually run the clamps gently down the actual back of the gums and then just let the lip actually naturally drop into its position and then close the clamps on it. What this does, it makes sure there's no actual distortion at the back of the lip itself. Approach with the needle, put your hand in the position as if the needle is a dart and then a nice smooth push straight through the lip. Just as you're coming out the back slightly contorted so you don't actually pierce his gums Withdraw the needle and then remove the actual clamps itself. Come back with the needle and the jewellery. Get the client to open his mouth slightly and place the need needle close onto the little bracket so it strengthens it just as you put the jewellery in. Withdraw the needle and then push the jewellery straight through. Just get some small forceps, apply it onto the bar, just take the cannula off, and then approach the piercing again with the ball, small forceps on, screw the ball on, just get the client to open his mouth, check your exit, Spot on. There you have, librette piercing. As I was saying, the client needs to retain in a week's time for a change over to an 8mm. With regards to aftercare, if internally he washes his mouth out with mouthwash once or twice a day and externally which is a little salt water for approximately, you're talking about a month to a month and a half. Right, next we're going to work on the tongue piercing. One of the main serious warnings that needs to be given about tongue piercing is always check a client's vein structure. If you don't actually check the vein structure and you actually pierce through something like this, we're talking about some serious, super funky complications going on. The best thing to do, check it. If you're not 100% safe, don't chase the book just for me. Back the piercing off, tell the client it can't actually be done. Right, the tongue itself is separating into two individual muscles held together in the middle by what's called a septum frame. This is actually where the piercing is going to be placed. We're not actually beginning causing any damage to the actual muscles itself. If you do actually catch them, you will actually give the client a lisp. One of the first things you want to do is prepare yourself up, check the piercing can actually be performed, and then we'll go forward with some marking. And just relax your tongue. Just clamping the tongue up nice and easy. Have a look on the top and have a look on the bottom. This particular client has actually got a vein that runs slightly up the side there, but I've got a nice, very positive space up there to actually run the piercing through, so that's where we'll be carrying it out. Take the clamps off and then prepare to mark. You get the client to stick his tongue back out again, wipe the area down. You're going to get a basis of where the septum frenum is, the natural crease in the middle of the tongue. If you can go like that. If you get the client to split his tongue like that, you can see positive in the middle that it is actually spot on. And there you go, we can prepare it up and start getting the piercing done. Right, the tongue piercing is nice and easy. You can just approach the client's tongue. That's it, nice and positive. Make sure it's spot on in the middle. 
checking your top mark, approach from the bottom. You can see positively where the set in front of me is. Put the needle on, check your mark, run the needle through. Let's draw the needle. Remove the clamps. Approach your piercing again with the actual bar that's going to be put in. And stick your tongue back out. Discard the needle. If you can keep your tongue back out for me. Keeping pressure on the bottom of the tongue, just run the jewelry straight through nice and positively. Keep it over the top. Discard the cannula. Make sure the client does keep his tongue out all the way through this process. Spit and shiny balls are very slippery little suckers, but you will be able to tame them. Screw the bottom ball on, hold the top, just push the bar up on itself slightly. There you have a tongue piece, and if you want, put your tongue back in. What you want to do, I fitted you with a 22mm bar. The reasoning for this is so you've got a nice amount of space because your actual tongue is going to actually swell. Basically, respect the fact you've got a tongue piercing, don't abuse it. With this actual process of actually the needle retention and stuff like this, you will actually find if you abuse the piercing over the next couple of days, you are going to get some black and blue markings. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Every single day, clean it down with mouthwash. So you come back in a week's time and we'll fit you with a 16mm bar. That'll be appropriate for your piercing in the long term. Right, let's pick up the pace of it. Let's do some ear work. We'll start there and build our way up to some serious piercings. Right, what we're going to be doing now is basic tragus piercing. We're going to be doing the same, basically as the ear. Wipe the area down. Make sure it's clean internally as well. Marking. Let's imagine the main protrusion there as a circle. And a mark in the middle. Approach it with the clamps, getting your needle ready. The technique with the piercing is to do a fast, positive move, but in the same breath, not fast enough, so you carry on through and stab the back of his head. This usually offends customers. Nice and easy, drop the clamps on. Same again, we're piercing with the dart. Draw the needle, draw the clamps, making sure you've got the ring in the forceps in a nice easy position to actually travel back through with it. Come back in with the needle, apply the jewellery, remove the needle. Putting your finger on the side of the tragus just to strengthen it, run the jewellery through and one nice positive move. Discard the cannula, remove the forceps. A good idea is always to put it in a nice positive place, fit in the ball, get the circuits and the ball. You always be positive not to actually overstress the actual. Ball itself, in the same breath, strong enough to open a 7mm ring. Turn the ring for show, and then just a quick wipe down to remove any traces that might be actually in the area. There you go. The tragus piercing is actually a very, very simplistic area of your body. doesn't really realise it's been pierced for about seven days. Then you're actually going to start to get some redness and some very slight swelling in the area. Same principle applies. As of tomorrow, clean it down with witch hazel or salt water and that will turn out a nice positive piercing. Right, now we're going to be doing an industrial. One of the most common causes of industrial rejection 
is trying to actually carry the piercing through with clamps. What clamps do is actually distort the actual piercing out of alignment so you can't get the natural flow of the bar itself. This actually means we need to actually do this piercing by hand. If you're doing this piercing by hand, you obviously need extreme caution, which as soon as you're dealing with needles, you need anyhow. Make sure everything's nice and cleaned. And then the bring bar up, just for positioning. Make your lines of where the actual piercing is going to be travelling. You can go from the top, so you've got your exit, and then on the side, so you've got your entry. You've got a nice positive flow of the piercing all the way through there. In regards to the piercing itself, as I was saying before, obviously extreme caution, but do treat each piercing individually, because in the end, we are actually doing two piercings. Holding the ear gently, just push the bar through. Follow the line, straight up, and actually jump back out on the top. And there you go, nice and easy. We'll draw the blade. Now, with regards to actually insertion of the jewellery, as I was saying before, treat each piercing as a single one. The needle back in, remove any air that might actually be in the way. Remove the needle. And run each piercing on its own. You will get some slight distortion in the ear, but you will actually be stretching the ear into position. You do need a slight amount of space actually left on the bar because you are going to find that the ear is going to swell slightly. There we go. Nice clean piercing. Make sure there's no air actually caught around the ball or anything like that. Cleaning wise, same again. Which is will salt water. Do be aware if you knock one piercing, it will actually affect the other piercing. Do you actually tell the client it's probably best to avoid actually sleeping on that particular area just until it actually desensitizes itself as well. Right, next piercing we're going to be doing is the dath. With the actual dath piercing, what you actually need to do is actually bend the needle physically. So, what you need to do, start off at the bottom with a very slight curve in it. Further up, slight curve in it, and just work your way all the way up to the top until basically the needles are an offset. Like that. What you need to make sure is the actual cannula itself isn't actually over the blade, the cutting element of the needle. Right, first things first, wipe the ear down. Nice easy piercing this is, as long as you use control and some guidance as well. What you want to do is approach here with a set, with a set of forceps and the needle itself. What you're going to be using the forceps for is for actual placement underneath to actually strengthen the data so it can actually receive the needle and then actually come in from the top with regards to the needle itself. Piercing, go through nice and easily. You won't actually be able to pull the needle out, so you just withdraw it into the cannula itself for the client's safety. Right, with regard to this piercing, you do need to be exceedingly careful when it comes to time to running the actual jewellery through. Place the jewellery at the bottom. 
I need a nice, very firm push all the way up. Discard the needle. Remove the clamps. Just position it so it's going to be nice and easy for you to actually put the ball on. Bring it out so it's a lot easier for you. Come to the piercing with your circlips already. Bring your ball in place. Sorry about the fingers everywhere. Take the clamps off. There you go, gate piercing. What you need to do, cleaning wise, same principle as always, wet chisel or salt water, both sides of the ring, and then a slight movement to the ring will actually take the actual cleaning into the area itself. Right, this particular piercing, what we're going to be doing, is called the septum. Place actually there into the nostril. It's a nice piercing, you can't actually do it with a ring or a septum keeper. Some people do prefer bars, but you do find that they do actually offset the soles when they are actually going through the healing process. One of the main things, first of all, to do is have a check up for the, the client's nose. The actual soft membrane tissue that you can actually feel, the very, very soft bit between your fingers is where you want to put the piercing through. Just above that, you will actually feel if there is actually any cartilage that's been broken in the time of actually having the nose pierced. This particular client has it done. What you want to do, put your initial marks on. Check the way your mark is. It's exactly where you should be running it. And then prepare yourself up for the piercing. There is a great warning with this particular style of how to do a septum piercing. I'm actually going to be clamping the underneath of the nose with my fingers. The reason being is you find you get a lot less distortion of the whole particular piercing itself and it will always sit a lot more naturally. The other side of the coin are you are pushing a needle actually through that's going to be exiting right by your fingers. Extreme caution. Yeah, stupidity is not the name of the game and the end you're looking after your clients actual health and yours as well. Just check your mark. the needle, return with the needle and the ring, discard the needle and then get actually ready to run the ring through. Remove the cannula, take the clamps off, prep the actual ring up, ready for receiving the ball. Got the circlips, steady yourself in. The quicker you can get this done, the easier it is for the client. There you go, septum piercing. What you need to do, make sure the client cleans both sides of the actual ring itself and then take care of the actual client's leaking eyes. Nice one. Let's go extreme. What we're going to be doing now is a nose along. Very, very, very painful piercing. What the client actually needs to be is up for the job. Same as you do. The piercing itself is a triple piercing in total with only the actual entry and the exit holes visible. The marking is absolutely crucial. Measurement is spot on, we've already done that before. We're going to be putting a 22mm bar in. And let's start putting some marks on. 
As you can tell by the way, a little habit, always stick dots on the back of your hand because it makes sure that the pen's working. to make sure that the actual client's ready and prepared for the piercing. Prepare your clamps. Actually compress the nose. Put clamps on both sides. Make sure they're nice and spot on. We're good with that. Get your needle, you need to push this in a 90 degree direction. Put it in place. If you just give the client a second to compose himself. And done there. Put the needle back in. In the bottom, discard the needle. Same again, clamp the nose, push the bar in a nice positive movement all the way through. Discard the candle. Screw the ball on, level the piercing on. There you go, a nose along the end.